Hello, viewers, and thank you for joining Virtual Blue COP25 and our panel, Ocean as a Solution to Climate Change, Inland Perspectives. My name is Lance Kittle. I am the Chapter Development Manager for the Inland Ocean Coalition, and I oversee the development and growth of our 15 current chapters throughout the United States. Today, I'm joined by Vicki Nichols Goldstein, Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, and Dr. Joni Kleifus. Vicki is the founder and executive director of the Inland Ocean Coalition, a group working to increase ocean advocacy in inland regions. Vicki has worked in the nonprofit and ocean conservation field for over 25 years from Washington, D.C. to Santa Cruz, California, addressing a multitude of ocean conservation issues. Dr. J. I'm sorry, Dr. Nichols is a scientist, author, speaker, and explorer. He works to create useful words that help fix what's broken in nature and in people. His focus is on water, wellness, and wildlife. Dr. Joni Kleipas is a senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where she works with climate scientists to understand how climate change affects coral reefs. She also founded a coral reef restoration program in Costa Rica. As countries grow increasingly aware of the anthropogenic effects on our ocean's health, communities are taking approaches to conserve, preserve, and restore our marine ecosystems. Ocean conservation techniques have begun to spread to inland communities, shifting the focus from coastal areas to a worldwide bandwidth. We will explore what inland communities are doing to protect the ocean from the inland. Thank you all for joining us again. I would like to jump into our first question. And this question will dive into a little bit more of the background of our speakers. The question is, our ocean is considered one of the most important resources on the planet. How has your work impacted ocean health and conservation? And we will start with you, Joni. We will move to Jay, and we will finish with Vicki. So Joni, please take it away. Thanks, Lance. Um, the work that I've done for the past uh, 30 plus years has been as a scientist. Um, I have studied oceanography in, in many different capacities, everything from ocean acidification, to ocean warming, but mainly how it impacts marine ecosystems. So I've worked um, mainly uh, at a national climate center here in Boulder, Colorado, very inland state, um, with uh, people that do predictions about climate change to try to understand how these marine ecosystems respond to climate change and how they respond in the future. And so um, I'd like to think some of my work has impacted ocean health and conservation. Certainly that is how I've changed my career over time. I started out trying to understand what the changes were, and now we're trying to use the same climate models and oceanographic models to understand where the solutions are. Um, so one of the biggest roles I have in my career is to try to use these models to identify, for example, where we should be putting our conservation efforts uh, to save coral reefs. And I think we'll probably talk about this a little bit more uh, later in the discussion, but coral reefs are one of the most threatened ecosystems we have. And we can't save every coral reef ecosystem from a warming and acidifying planet. But what we can do is try to find those places where they're most resilient and most likely to succeed. So that is one of the ways I've been trying to work. And then the, the second way, you know, it's a little frustrating to always predict uh, the continual de decline of an ecosystem. So myself and many other scientists have turned toward uh, actively working with coral reef ecosystems to try to bring them back through interventions. And that it's, it's very similar to reforestation, but we try to do informed re reforestation by considering what, um, how to grow corals, how to grow them more resilient, how to maintain genetic diversity. And so um, that's, that is how we're trying to impact um, ocean conservation um, from 
it, you don't have to live on the, the coast to do that. You can be right in the middle of the continent to be able to do that work. Jay. Yeah, I think I, I'm like Joni, I'm a, a scientist. I, I've studied um, the ocean and wildlife, ocean wildlife for many decades, uh, focused primarily on sea turtles and sea turtle migration and uh, genetics. And they're a great animal to look at uh, in terms of all the other issues facing, facing ocean, whether it's the decline of coral reefs or plastic pollution, uh, overfishing, bycatch, marine protected areas. Um, but my, my work with sea turtles, I think, is probably most defined by the successes that our, our collaborative uh, approach, working with fishing communities, working with sea turtle hunters has had. So uh, I always feel like I'm surrounded by bad news uh, in the environmental community, especially when it comes to oceans. But when it comes to the sea turtle populations that I've, I've worked with, it's very good news. The populations are on the rise. They're surprisingly rebounding. Uh, and so there's some great success stories. So I'm really interested in figuring out why some activities and some projects are successful and others struggle and what the factors are. And it, it generally uh, has led me to hang out with neuroscientists and psychologists, <laughs> uh, a whole different group of scientists, um, not like my fellow turtle biologists, but people who study the human brain, and to un better understand uh, the, the you know the behavior change aspect. And so, if you're working with turtle hunters to save sea turtles, you better understand human behavior. Uh, you should also need to understand turtle behavior. And so, the last ten years, I've focused on. Uh, what is usually referred to as the human dimension of ocean conservation, uh, also of lakes and rivers, and looking at the emotional connection, the science behind the emotional connection to water in general, and how we can leverage that as a, a political force, an economic force, uh, and a kind of an unstoppable way of galvanizing the blue movement. So um, we call that work Blue Mind, uh, blue for the water, mind for the brain. And, uh, and I still work with sea turtles around the world, particularly the Pacific Ocean, and I love collaborating with, with my fellow coral, coral reef biologists and nudibranch biologists and everybody who studies the things that, that turtles eat as well. So I guess that's my background, yeah. Great, thanks, Jay. And finally, Vicky. I'm an ocean lover that landed inland. So I guess in a nutshell, I've been studying and working with communities on the East Coast and the West Coast, worked for NOAA, really worked on how to engage people, organizations, um, governance, governments, and how to protect the ocean. And then I landed inland and started up the Colorado Ocean Coalition because I really wanted to understand how people inland can really relate to the ocean. And after doing all the coastal work for so many years, I always thought when people go back to Kansas, to Colorado, how can they take that ocean love that they experienced on the coast back into their communities? So I always laugh when I think, um, be careful what you ask for, because then I had the opportunity to really experiment with that. So starting off with the Colorado Ocean Coalition, um, we organized, we put together communities. It was successful. Other communities around the country wanted to also start chapters. And then when we had about a half a dozen, we decided to revamp in 2017 to be the Inland Ocean Coalition. and. I think it's so important because when you look at the United States and most of the communities are coastal that are really engaging in ocean policy and ocean initiatives. And then you've got the rest of the country that's just not really engaged. So the idea was how do you engage the communities inland? So they're working with their legislative leaders, they're changing their habits around plastic pollution. They're really talking about 
making concerted changes for healthy oceans and healthy climate. So it was that real inspiration to see, can we get it going? And I have to say, Jay, you were one of the uh, early helpers when I had this idea. I floated it with you and I'm like, what do you think? And you're like, this is such a cool idea. I love it, Vicki. And then once we got going, Joni was like, oh my gosh, this is a great idea. Let I want to be involved. So it really has been connecting people who care about the ocean, who love the ocean, who are just thinking a little bit out of the box about how to bring people together and make a true difference. And that's my contribution to really creating this energy looking at the ocean as a solution to climate change and citizen engagement. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for diving into your backgrounds a little bit more. It really shows that all of you are interconnected, even though your studies may be in uh, differentiating fields. And I believe that's the idea of bringing the inland ocean movement to the inland, is finding everyone who has those little uh, niche backgrounds and and each of those parts constitutes this greater whole of you don't just have to see the ocean to protect it so with that being said i would love to jump into another question and vicky if you wouldn't mind answering this question uh to begin um i understand that ocean health is a global issue but inland communities can't even see the ocean right so so why should inland communities care about what happens with the ocean. The ocean is so important to all of us. Literally half of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean. The plants, um, whether they're the plankton, the kelp, the seagrass. So we really need the ocean. It regulates our climate. Um, it brings us joy. So I really feel that people, no matter where they live, can really tap into that ocean love. Um, many of the supporters we have are coastal, and many are those who live here who just have really got, gotten that sense of like, I, I want to be part of that ocean initiative, and I want to make a difference. Again, being in the middle of the country, there are so many opportunities to protect the ocean, to share the ocean love, and to get our legislative leaders engaged in that whole orientation. So I feel like we are a big part of the population that loves the ocean, cares for the ocean, and truly needs the ocean, even though we don't get a chance to see it on a daily basis. Great. And Joni, do you have any thoughts about why inland communities should care about what happens with the ocean? Well, of course I do. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the inland, you know, we're pretty connected to the ocean, even though we are um, inland. I, I, always, I always like to talk about the big picture, though, first, when we talk about why the ocean is important. And, and I know Jay can relate to this because he had this whole blue marble campaign. But, you know, our planet is extremely special because of its ocean and its atmosphere particularly the ocean. There really hasn't been the discovery of another planet like this, where we have this beautiful habitable space that's primarily because of the ocean. You know, one of my favorite photographs is the one that was taken by Cassini from Saturn. And that picture of the earth is blue, even from that long, long distance. So we think of Mars as being the red planet and we, you know, consider these planets by their distinctive characteristics, but our characteristic that is distinctive is the ocean. So, you know, people know this number that 70% of the ocean is, 70% uh, of the planet is covered by the ocean. What, it, it feels so vast. It feels so like just huge that we could never affect it. But really it's not that thick. It's a very thin layer. If you can, you know, run a 10K to the bottom of the ocean, you'd hit the bottom of the ocean in the deepest part. It is not that thick. I mean, you can drive to work and you're driving further than the, than the depth of the ocean. So it's also vulnerable to what we do. 
So there's there's this preciousness with this blueness of our planet and in the ocean. And so it's, um, I think when people think about that, when they take that that mile high view or that hundred mile view of, of the planet, we we do have a sense that it's special and that we depend on it because it, it is um, really affecting our climate, our water source. Most of the rain we get comes from the ocean. So even if you live in Kansas, a lot of the, the rain is sourced from over the ocean. So there, there's just, uh, a, just innumerable ways that we should value it. But I think it's, it's just how, as Jay said in the first question, how do we get people to sort of uh, psychologically think about it that way and to appreciate it. And that psychological connection may be hard for some people to encounter because they may have never seen the ocean uh, in the first place. And and Jay, in, in your answer, I would also love to hear a little bit of input on how do you foster that intrinsic value of the ocean in inland communities and, and why that intrinsic value is important for inland communities in reference to the ocean. Yeah, I think I, I start off by saying most people don't see the ocean every day. And like probably like 99.9% .9 of the world does not really see the ocean every day, including Californians, including people in Santa Cruz, uh, which is a, a coastal town. Most of the population of Santa Cruz doesn't see the ocean every day. A lot of people in LA have never been to the beach. So when we talk about inland, we're talking about a much bigger group of people than, than Colorado <laughs> and Kansas and Nebraska and Illinois. We're talking about most even coastal states have very large inland communities. So um, we're really talking about the majority of humans that have a, a disconnect from the coast and ocean on a daily if not lifelong basis. So we do have to reach beyond um, the personal experience or the daily surfing or, or diving. And you know, very few of us are actually marine biologists or marine policy professionals. So I think that's, that's kind of a starting point when we talk about inland, defining inland. It's inland is the majority of our population of humans on earth. Uh, you know, I think people long maybe to go visit the ocean more than they actually do. So that's part of it. But whenever I speak to groups of people, even if it's very far from large bodies of water, uh, I ask them, what's your water? That's my first question. And everyone has an amazing story. Everybody has some water that they love. And that's the starting point. So if we start from a, a place of, of lacking and longing and feeling bad that they're so far from the ocean, then you get a little bit of stress and that's not a good place to start a conversation. But if we start with the question, what's the water you love? It might be your bathtub, might be the river, might be the pooter, might be Lake Michigan, it might be um, a creek, could be a farm pond, tell me about it. And they start getting excited about the water that they fell in love with, the water that they explore. And that's, that's where we wanna start the conversation because it turns out all that water connects to the ocean and as was previously stated, the ocean gives us the rain, which puts the water back into those lakes and creeks and, and ponds and rivers. So, you know, that's the water cycle that we all learned in third grade. Uh, so remember, remembering that it's, it really is all about the water and it's all connected. And if we're trying to connect the, the quote unquote inland people to the coastal uh, folks, uh, I think it's broadening it into a water conversation. Uh, is, is a really good idea. So that's where I usually start. I ask people, what's your water? And then listen. And the answers are, are always very cool. Yeah. Jay, I'm sure you've heard some incredible stories um, following with that question. And, and so really, it seems like the ocean, whether it be in front of you or not, is a part of everyone's daily life whether you're inland or in a coastal community. So let's expand on that a little bit. And uh, so the ocean, right? It can impact everyone's daily life from the air we breathe, like Vicki mentioned, uh, to the food and water um, that we eat and drink. So, so really how does caring for the ocean begin in an inland community? Um, and Joni, we'll start with you this time. Well, I think Jay hit on a lot of the, the important points is being aware of where your water comes from 
and where it ends up when you use it. So it's, it's where do we fit in in this cycle of, um, of, you know, our resources, how we take the water from our precious resources and then what do we do with that water afterwards? So that is a, um, an everyday life of, I think people do become aware of that once you point it out. Um, people value clean water and it's led to some of the problems that we've had in terms of like too, too much um, throwaway plastic bottles and that sort of thing. But uh, one of the ways I have people in my field, have people value the ocean is to not just think about it as a body of water, but to have people realize that it's a tremendous living space for many, many organisms. So when you get people to, to understand that, that this is not just a place where we pull food out of through fishing, it's not just a place that gives us something to eat, it's something where a lot of marine organisms have evolved in very intense ways, just as, as, as spectacular as the, the animal life we see on land, just as intelligent as the animal life we've seen on land. Uh, when you describe to people stories about just the fish in their fish tank and what those fish are hearing and what they're smelling or tasting, um, you know, if you give them something, a, a life, like the way you think of your dog, then people can relate that this is not just um, something that I use, but it's something that houses a lot of sentient beings. And, it, and it, it, you know, in my conversations with people, when I speak about the ocean in that way, you can see that they're actually relating more to what's inside rather than just to that big flat surface that we look out over uh, when we get a chance to see it. So those are kind of how I, try to break those barriers with people. I, I hope that kind of answers your question, but it, it's a little off the wall, but it is uh, this psychological way that I've learned how to speak about the ocean. Well, and I'm sure that bringing up these, these ideas and expanding on it, it really does create that awareness, right? Uh, Jay, do you wanna speak more on kind of the, the psychological aspect of caring for the ocean from the inland? Yeah, we have a, a, a colleague who's at UC Irvine who studies the science of awe and wonder, these two emotions that we were just talking about. And when you feel awe and wonder about other life forms, about you know, these creatures that co-inhabit the planet of awe and wonder, looking at a forest or a sunset or listening to a, a raging river or putting your head under and looking around in the ocean, physiologically we shift and we've all felt it and you know i can ex i can ex explain it but you will you understand it because you've felt it and when you experience awe and wonder it shifts us into a, a different state of mind which builds our empathy it builds our compassion it opens us up to the other you know um, other people and other organisms so awe and wonder creates empathy and compassion which is what we need so if you're speaking in, in Boulder, Colorado about coral reefs, you had better do it in a way that, that brings that empathy and builds that compassion and tell the stories and fill the room with awe and wonder. That's, our, that's our, our most, one of our most powerful tools uh, in this, this work. And you know, the, the great communicators of all time in the ocean space have all known that. You know, think of, the, of Cousteau and, and some of the, the films we grew up with and and then the modern versions of the Cousteau's work and the films that they make, it's, it's about the awe and the wonder and, and connecting us. And that really builds our empathy and compassion, gets us outside of ourselves. And then it gets harder to do bad things to this, this other space, these, you know, these other animals. Uh, and that leads us to change our behavior. So um, Paul Piff, if you wanna look him up, I call him Dr. Awesome. Uh, because he studies the science of awe, and he likes he likes being called that. So if you look at Paul Piff and his research on awe and wonder, it's really fascinating, and I highly recommend that everybody working in conservation become familiar with that body of research because it's it really drives the changes that we need. Great, and and to dive in a little bit more into this this empathy and compassion, Vicky. Your empathy and compassion with the ocean drove you to begin an organization inland 
that focuses on ocean conservation. How have you seen inland communities begin to show their compassion and empathy? One of the really great things about the Inland Ocean Coalition is that we have a lot of fun and we create community. And we started out with blue drinks, getting people to gather up, whether you were a scientist, a teacher, a diver, a photographer, gathering up and um, whether you're having beers or wines or club sodas, but it was getting people together as a sense of community and sharing stories. And once you get people together and start thinking about next steps, you get excited and then you have this, this memory and then you kind of tap into your emotional connection that you have with the ocean or with an experience or with a dream that you had when you were young. So I really feel like both what um, Jay and Joni have said, like tapping into that 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 inner child sense, that excitement, that sense of wonder is really what drives, I think, the success of people gathering to work on ocean protection initiatives inland and coastally as well. It's just that um, you recognize the oceans in trouble and we often will share that, but you can't focus on the negative because there are so many positive things that we can do So keeping that joy as part of the conversation and that joy as part of the community, I think is really important to tackle the challenges, but not lose hope with the opportunities and the possibilities. And I think with COP25, especially the blue COP, we are recognizing that we really need to come together. Climate change is happening the ocean is the big solution to climate change. And let's team up and take that love and that excitement and really move it forward and then bring that into the political arena. And right now our national leadership isn't doing that, but states and cities and communities are. So having that sense that regardless of whether we're being driven as a nation, our communities throughout the country and throughout the world are really supporting that initiative. And so I think it comes from a place of love and joy and wonder, and we need to keep that alive. And I think that's really the key to making a big difference and moving us in the right direction. Great. Thank you, Vicki. That's a great answer from all of you. I really appreciate that. And from that, we can see that there's so many different components to uh, creating an awareness about the ocean from inland communities. And so what I'd like to talk about now is kind of how we take that next step, right? So as communities and constituencies build an awareness around ocean conservation, what can help turn that awareness into a quantifiable action. Uh, Dr. Jay, let's start with you. You know, I think one of the simple things that we we often forget is uh, just to get in the water as much as you can. Uh, I know as a professional, sometimes you kind of look around, you're like, wow, it's been a while. Uh, I haven't haven't jumped in the water, in the wild water in a while. Um, And then take someone with you. I, I was just speaking at a, um, the International Surf Therapy Symposium. And there are hundreds of organizations now around the world that, that take first responders, veterans, at-risk youth, a whole range of people who might be sort of suffering on land uh, and in pain, and they get into the water and they surf and they find joy that Vicky was talking about. They fall in love with themselves again. They fall in love with the ocean that helps them heal. And for many of them, they haven't been in the water. So um, it's really, I don't wanna you know, make it sound overly overly simple, but we've kind of, kind of put our heads down in, into some of the nitty gritty you know, science work and forgotten to keep getting you know, new people into the water so that they have that, that transformative experience. And what we see on the research side 
is that it is medicine for those who need it most. Uh, it works as well as pharmaceuticals and other kinds of therapies. And you know, the long-term clinical research is, is being published. So our oceans, our lakes, our rivers are in fact a, a massive public health uh, resource for our emotional and mental health as well as our physical and social health. And we don't talk about that very well. So that's, I think that would be a big thing I, I'm focused on is first of all, getting the words right and helping people in leadership positions to use those words, but then to evolve that to legislation. So what would legislation that codifies Blue Mind look like? What if we had legislation that said, this healthy ocean is medicine for our veterans and our first responders? and you can't mess it up. And if you do, you're gonna pay the price, not just for the ecological and economic damage, but for the emotional damage. That would be interesting. So I think that's a kind of exciting rubber hits the road conversation. Uh, it may not be viable at the federal level in the US at the moment, but places like Australia and, and other, maybe at the state level, uh, it's, it's getting very interesting to sort of expand our, our definition of the value of a healthy ocean um, beyond the economic and ecological to include the emotional health benefits. So um, that's kind of where I get excited these days is those, those sort of big transformative ideas that kind of rewrite the, uh, our talking points, rewrite the policy and evolve our, the whole conversation. Great, thanks, Jay. And and maybe to just jump into a little bit of that policy um, point a little bit, Vicky, do you mind jumping in and cueing us in on uh, what do you think can help turn awareness into quantifiable action on the legislative scale? Oh, I love that part of the conversation. Um, I think it's really exciting that we are able to establish chapters in different states in the U.S. We have house reps and we have senators who are representing all of these states. And unless we can convey to them that they have constituents in that region and the constituents care about the ocean, we're not really gonna change policy. So for example, we have Senator Cory Gardner in Colorado, who is the chair of the Committee on Oceans and Weather, getting him involved, which is a bit tricky, but working with his staff and meeting with him on a regular basis and nudging him to say, you have this committee, you've got to take some responsibility and you have to start working on these issues is absolutely critical because he's one of the most powerful people in the country right now who is chairing this committee on, that will really address oceans and climate. So having people in his district, in his state, contacting him and saying, you need to be more involved in ocean climate action is really where we need to go. And then that's the same with many other congressional leaders. They're, they're serving on subcommittees of house resources for oceans, wildlife and waterways, encouraging those legislative leaders to vote pro-ocean pro water and then keeping the pressure on so they know that the constituents are tracking their votes, they know where they're voting or how they're voting and then really holding them accountable. And so I think legislatively we have a huge opportunity to nudge our leaders to do the right thing now while we still have time and then make sure we let them know that we are tracking their votes and can either thank them or say, you need to do a better job. Wonderful. And Joni, you come from quite the, the hard science background, right? And a lot of your work is involved with um, the science behind the oceans. And I'd love to hear your perspective of um, how can we turn our awareness of these ocean issues into quantifiable action? Well, I, I really can echo what both uh, Jay and Vicki have said and kind of combine those two. I mean, um, I've done some testifying in front of Congress myself 
And I can tell you that when we have, you know, on those committees where we're trying to describe something like the plight of coral reefs or the or some aspect of coral reef protection and trying to save bills, whether it was ocean acidification or some sort of coral reef act, the, those legislators, which had, you know, who had seen and um, either snorkeled or dived on a healthy coral reefs and degraded coral reefs were very supportive. It didn't matter which side of the aisle they were on. They had seen it, they believed it. So that sort of visual, bring, bringing this very visually to our legislators is, is a really powerful thing. Just um, last week, I was in the field with some, um, some of the vice minister of the environment's uh, staff in our underwater coral nursery and they had the chance to work with us and also plant corals. That is life-changing. Not every, we can't do this with everybody, but they were extremely supportive of this sort of hopeful solution and legislation to do that. So sometimes, you know, you have to work with legislators and put pressure in the way that they're used to, which is, which is basically, um, you know, how are they going to maintain, you know, the support from their own communities and, and stay in office and be able to pass uh, meaningful legislation that they can get credit for. But uh, also, I mean, they're human too. They're human just like us. And so being able to appeal to, to them in a very uh, sort of visual way, I think is really uh, important. From the other side, when you're working just as Vicki has done with the Inland Ocean Coalition or just with whoever your communities are, to just get them really excited about something, to, to push for legislative change or to push for some sort of change in their own communities to reduce plastics, reduce water waste, whatever it is, uh, it is very powerful from the bottom up. I, I've never known how to be the most effective, whether you go straight to the people making the, the laws or you really motivate people from underneath. I've never had a really good answer to that question. Maybe one of you two do, but I feel like it's, like it's always a juggling act of where you put your energy, but they're both necessary. You can't do one without the other. And so I give kudos to people like Vicki and Jay that are trying to push these kind of changes because I know they're very familiar with that problem. Great, thanks, Joni. And, and we can see that there's many different ways for communities to turn um, an idea into an action, right? And at this point, what, what do we have to lose? Right, we, we can all make that difference. We can all make that movement, um, but it only takes the first step. So at this point, I'd like to shift us a little bit away uh, from the topics we've been covering um, and dive into a new idea, right? So a recent report, the special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate, also known as SROC, brought forth evidence that the ocean and climate are interconnected. Now, coming from all of your different backgrounds, is this the first evidence that shows that our climate and oceans are connected? Uh, Vicki, let's start out with you. No, this is not the first report, but what it has done, it basically said the ocean is taking the heat. So it has really confirmed that the ocean has really been a bigger player than most of the public has been aware of. Um, the ocean is heating up more. It's becoming warmer. It's becoming more acidic. Uh, there's less oxygen in the ocean and it's happening a lot faster than we anticipated. So it really was more of a wake up call that it's happening now and I think many of the scientists, as most scientists are, are very conservative. And when the data came out that it's like, no, it is happening now. We have to get on this. We're running out of time. We've got to really take this seriously. Um, it, it shifted the perspective of many people to recognize that it's not just a climate issue. It is a serious ocean climate issue. And we really need to focus on the ocean as part of the solution. Great. And Joni, I'm sure that you've seen evidence of this connection uh, before, but have you 
uh, really stumbled upon anything that points out these these facts as clearly as as SROC does. Uh, I, I think the, the SROC report was, um, it really is a, a milestone in terms of, of making these connections. Um, I work at a climate center, I mean, in an oceanography section, and this is what our group does day in and day out is study the, the physical and chemical interactions between the ocean and the biosphere. I mean, the, um, the ocean and the atmosphere and the biosphere. And it's... Um, you know, we've we've sort of understood the magnitude of, of, of these changes um, for quite a long time, but having it all in one place and having it, you know, all of these studies synthesized into this report, it was very powerful. Just flipping through this report, trying to, you know, it gives you a pit in your stomach because the, the news is bad. I mean, it's bad on a lot of fronts. Um, my working on coral reefs, I mean, there was a a report just prior to this, the 1.5 degrees centigrade report too, basically just showed how um, urgent it, you know, our needs are right now to keep to the Paris Climate Accord, which would hold us to a cap of 1.5 degrees centigrade warming. Even going up to two centigrade, two centigrade degrees warming was, is a, uh, a huge, impact on coral reefs. It, it, at 1.5 degree, we still have hope to save, you know, a, a, a few coral reefs. At two degrees Celsius, then we, we start exceeding any capacity to, to keep those reefs around. So we are at this sort of threshold point where we have to do a lot to prevent further damage. But, um, but what this report shows is that it's really worth it to uh, do everything we can to keep climate change in check. And so uh, that goes, as Vicki mentioned, with warming, with ocean acidification, and with ocean deoxygenation. Those three triple problems in the ocean are, are really going to affect our, the ocean biology um, and ecosystems in profound ways, ways that we can't even predict. And Vicki's right, we've always been very conservative. We don't like to overstate the problem or to come off as alarmist. And I think in this report, uh, I think, yes, the scientists finally said, this, this is looking bad, we're, we're going to, you know, the evidence is there, the observations are there, and the predictions are there. So there's no argument that, that the ocean is a, is a huge, um, factor in climate change, but it's also a, a huge um, recipient of all the insults associated with climate change. So that was that was wh where I put that report and the authors, uh, I, I highly respect them. Um, I've known them personally and they've, they've really done a, a beautiful job of pulling this together. And it's hard, it's a Herculean task to pull something like this together and get everyone to agree. Great, thanks, Joni. Jay, what's your take on this latest IPCC report? I know that the science is there, but do you believe that the psychology is there? Yeah, I think what we're starting to see is um, more uh, climate communicators and more ocean communicators are hanging out with people who study beha human behavior and learning you know, the, the best ways to communicate this, these kinds of um, heavy, um, heavy pieces of news, uh, you know, dire predictions. Um, I think what, what was real clear to me is that this isn't a, um, we're not kicking the can down the road anymore. Like it's now, this is, we're, we're in it. The changes are happening. Um, we're, we're not in a, you know, a, a 50 year wait and see what happens kind of time horizon. Um, that we need to mitigate and adapt while we uh, switch our behaviors, while we move to cleaner ways, more sustainable ways of making a living on our, our water home. And that that um, isn't, isn't just about, you know, panicking and voting and changing your light bulbs. It's, it's deeper than that. It's, it's kind of getting back to kind of who are we? What are we made out of? Um, just telling a telling a bigger, better story of what it's what it means to be 
a human being here on this little blue ball, uh, this little blue marble home of ours. Um, that's mostly water. We're mostly water. Um, that's, you know, that's a big task, but I think that's, that's part of it. You know, we're, it's a new stage, new, the science is clear, you know, we're, we're going to see some changes. We're going to lose places and animals that we really care about. Um, parts of our communities are going to be underwater, but with that, there are the, all these opportunities, uh, ahead to, to live differently. And, um, that's, that was my, kind of my takeaway from, from the report, but also from the ways the report was communicated. Uh, and really not, not surprising um, if you've been paying attention to the role of the ocean in climate for the past several decades. Um, it's, not, it's not big new news that you know, our, our climate is the same. You know, it's synonymous with the ocean. Uh, what happens to the ocean is what happens to us. Uh, um, completely here on this planet. So, um, but I think that the challenge is how do you communicate, you know, whether it's plastic pollution or climate change, how do you communicate the seriousness and the, I mean, the scary parts of it uh, in a way that keeps people creative and collaborative and calm enough to do the work that's necessary and not just fighting and yelling and arguing and melting down and into what I call red mind, uh, which eventually leads you to gray mind, which is burnout. And we all, we've all either felt that or seen it in, in our organizations, in our agencies, uh, in, in our own lives. So um, we don't want to burn out. We got we to gotta jump in the water once in a while and chill and hang out with your friends and go to blue drinks with the Inland Ocean Coalitions and, you know, recharge and reset. Uh, I think that's a key point, you know, for anybody who's listening to this, you're probably fairly well informed, you know what's at stake, we're not here to convince you that, you know, we have an environmental set of crises, um, but stay strong, you know, stay creative, stay calm, uh, fight for sure, but also love, and I guess that's, that's always my big reminder is don't burn out, please don't burn out, especially if you've trained yourself for 30 or 40 years to be as good as you are at this stuff. We can't afford to lose you. So um, keep your head in the game. Yeah. Great. Thank you all again for your, for your um, answers and your opinions. These are all really valuable, um, not only in the process of sharing and storytelling, but in advancing the topic of the inland ocean movement, right? It's not just a coastal issue anymore. We know this through science, we know this through psychology and connection. The ocean is each and every one of us, whether we like it or not, day in and day out. So uh, at this moment, I would really like to take uh, just a couple of minutes to answer some of the questions that have been submitted during our panel discussion. And the first is about how, how concerned are people in the inland? I mean, obviously we all share a passion for ocean, uh, its health conservation, but but how how do communities um, express this? Are are they concerned? So so Vicky, again, we'll start with you. Have you have you met people who are concerned about um, the ocean from inland states, and and how do you overcome that if if they're not? Oh, we have lots of concern. Yeah, um, I don't want to sound. I don't want to lighten up the topic, but we just had a masquerade mermaid ball <laughs> a few weeks ago. Um, we had a couple of hundred people attend and we had all of the messages around the, the room, you know, plastic pollution, we had mermaids, we had things that people could do. We had a message in a bottle where people could actually send a letter to their legislators. So yes, every day, whether people are coming to our events, or they are emailing us, they are concerned, they wanna get involved, they wanna do something positive. And I think that there is a lot of emotional connection that we've been talking about um, this, this last hour. They see what's happening, they've read the reports, they're, they're hearing the news, the social media, the ocean's in trouble, we have to galvanize, 
We have to work together. And I think the positive message is coming out that it is not too late. Like we're not gonna grow up, my kids are not gonna grow up with the same ocean that I grew up in, right? Like right now, I used to go fishing with my pop-up for weak fish and off the coast of New Jersey. And I read recently, there are no more weak fish off the coast of New Jersey. They're moving. So it's gonna be different. And I think it's really important that we talk about the challenges, the changes, but certainly the opportunities for engagement and to really step up and take your interest, your passion and do something positive with it. We have a lot of possibilities. And so keeping that hopefulness I think is really critical. Um, but yeah, back to the, the question, sure. People are really, really concerned. They want to get involved. And that's why we now have 15 chapters in the US because people want to get involved and want to try to find some ways to engage themselves and their community. So it's good. Bad news, good news moving forward. I, I really have a lot of hope. Wonderful. And, and Jay, you've mentioned a lot about just how using words can really transform someone's idea on the ocean. Can you elaborate on that? And have you used words to overcome some of these boundaries? Yeah, you know, I think I think what we our, our tendency in the past was to kind of rely on a different set of emotions, maybe the you know to galvanize people around fear and guilt, uh, maybe anger, and then a, a heap of factoids. And what the science suggests is that that doesn't work. Um, that toolkit is ineffective. It will move the needle, but it'll in, in a sprint, but it's not sustainable. It does, you don't base a movement on fear and guilt. You, as Vicky pointed out, you base it on love. That's what's sustainable. It's always been the case. Um, so that's, I think, you know, reframing the conversation, you know, in building the blue movement around the things that work and the optimism. Um, look at the, the best advertisers, you know, that you, whatever comes to mind for you, the best ads that you think are most effective, they're probably not about fear, guilt, and anger. Uh, they're probably about more positive things. And so if we're, if we're going to build a successful movement, I think we need to do that. I would also say that we, we, need, we need to hear from the inland voices because um, we haven't fixed these problems. We haven't solved many of them. We're, it keeps getting kind of worse. So whatever we're doing and whoever's doing it, uh, including myself, um, you know, I guess no offense, but it's not really working that well. We need, we need new ideas. We need young voices. We need inland voices. We need more diverse perspectives. Uh, we need um, more creativity. So if we can tap into uh, the people who live in the mountains and who love the rivers and lakes, who have successfully protected them and say, how did you do that? We want to, we want to copy what you did there over here with the ocean. That it could be a rich resource of solutions and ideas and certainly the, the positive energy that we need. So I think that's one of, one of the strengths of the Inland Ocean Coalition is, is that, that new set of ideas and a diversity of, of thinking and perspectives. Um, I got my PhD at the University of Arizona studying sea turtles. So I, I kind of know what I'm talking about here. Uh, being in the desert studying sea turtles, everybody was like, that's weird. But I learned so much from desert ecologists about the work that we were doing in Mexico with sea turtles. And so that cross-pollination uh, is, we need more of that. We need, we need big new innovative ideas. And so that's, uh, that's kind of fun. And we also need to talk about what didn't work and be really clear about our you know, quote unquote failures and really study what worked. You know, as, as few and far in between as they may be, I think it's really important to look at the success stories and really dissect them, not just the, the ecological science, but also the emotional science, the human side and, and replicate them. So um, that's what gives me like Vicky and Joni, I think the optimism, you know, every day I meet people who are, who light me up, you know, are so excited and um, so full of ideas and passion. And it's, it's that's what's in, uh, kind of, 
snowballs and it's it really is um it, it's contagious yeah wonderful and and Joni what's your take on on conveying this science and and how can conveying these sciences uh, help us overcome some of these boundaries that, that we've discussed and are, are hoping to move away from? Well, um, you know, to, to get to that first part of that, which is, you know, are people inland or people that, you know, are, are people tuning into this? Are they aware? Um, and, and how do we tap into that? I, I, depends on which groups you're talking to. I would say I run into some groups that are not aware at all. And I also run into a lot of groups uh, that are completely turned off. So, and, and that is part of our failure. I, I spoke for years about ocean warming and ocean acidification and how it's going to affect ecosystems. It was news, people were interested, but we had no solutions other than to say, we need to stop climate change. So we weren't giving people anything um, to do except write your legislator or whatever. We weren't really giving people much um, to do, at least in my circles we weren't. Uh, we weren't giving them solutions. We weren't coupling the problem with some sort of way to have a solution. And about five years ago, I started talking about some of the work we were doing with, with restoration. That was a huge surprise. I never even had to mention climate change people that did not even like say, believe in climate change were listening because they were eager and hungry for a solution that would, maybe it makes them feel better that somebody's trying to do something, but a lot of those people also volunteer and wanna be part of the solution. And in no time, those people are then receptive to the message of climate change. It's, it's a really, was a very interesting discovery for me to find that communicating climate change was actually through a solution, even if it was a minor solution, something that people get, get, get excited about. And so, you know, when I'm on the plane or anywhere, you never know who you're gonna talk to. When you, when, you know, I can remember talking to people and telling them how bad it's going to be. And it, it, you, Jay's right, you go nowhere with that. But talking about this cool project that you're doing, whether it's what Vicki is doing with the Inland Ocean Coalition, some of these cool stuff that they're doing, or Jay working with sea turtles, um, and the success story, say, you know, having a success story about this, the sea turtles or anything, those little steps just can flip one of those minds that have turned off into, I want to be part of the solution. I really see this with younger people a lot. Uh, it is amazing and giving them a vision that, I mean, they, they know that things are going to get worse, but giving them a vision that actually things can get better. And, you know, we're going to continue to see climate change accelerate for the next 20 or 30 years. But if we can stick to low emission scenario and we can start doing things to help these ecosystems bridge through this sort of tough period, they're going to start th seeing things get better. And we never say that. We never say that we can make the world a better place through our actions. So that's the kind of way that I pull in people that could care less about the ocean <laughs> by, by trying to entrain them into being part of this, this sort of beautiful vision. And uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm misleading people when I say that. It is kind of the optimism in me, but I think it is a, a necessary vision we have to have. Otherwise, we're not gonna get there. Great. Thank you, Joni, Vicki, and Jay, as always. Um, so we've covered a lot in the past hour, right? We've introduced the idea of the, the blue movement, the inland ocean movement, making its way from the coasts to the heart of not only the United States, but all throughout the world. We're seeing evidence that clearly points us in the direction of action. And at the end of the day, we're all hoping that positivity reigns supreme. Um, Joni, I would love to thank you so much for joining the panel. Vicki, you've been great. Uh, Dr. J, again, all of your input is, is really contributing to this overarching theme of you don't have to see the ocean to protect it. And every step in the right direction is a step in the right direction for the ocean, the climate, and our world in whole. 
So again, I would like to thank all of you for your time and uh, answering my questions today. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Lance, thank you. You did a great job. And thank you, uh, Jerry and Jay. Appreciate it. Great. Enjoyed hanging out with you virtually.